Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for Expedited Partner Therapy and Sexually Transmitted Infection Prevention Strategies for Youth. I'm very excited to be hosting this session and I'm going to turn it over to our presenter, Kayla Heakin who is an STI prevention specialist with Essential Access Health. Thanks, Haley. Again, uh, my name is Kayla Heakin. I use she, her pronouns. I'm an STI prevention specialist with Essential Access Health. Um, I am based in our Berkeley office and I primarily work with the California project area. So the whole state of California from the border with Oregon to the border with Mexico, with the exception of San Francisco and Los Angeles counties. Um, a lot of the focus of my work is on expanding access to expedited partner therapy, particularly for chlamydia and gonorrhea. I also focus on addressing the congenital syphilis crisis in the state of California as well as supporting with our Teen Source Youth Advisory Board to help get the opinions, wants, and needs of California teens reflected in sexual health resources and materials for them. So today, as Haley already mentioned, you may have read from the description, um, we are going to be reviewing best practices for expedited partner therapy, which is also called EPT for short. We've also used the term patient delivered partner therapy to describe this practice, um, also known as PDPT. Um, we are transitioning to using the term expedited partner therapy to be more in line with national guidelines, but the language in California law has previously been PDPT. So that's why you may hear both terms utilized today. And before we get started, I wanted to launch a poll to kind of get a sense of how many people in the virtual room are familiar with the term expedited partner therapy. So if you can just respond to the poll, let us know, have you heard of the term expedited partner therapy? Also, if any of you want to share in the chat, if any of you already um, practice expedited partner therapy in any of your school-based health centers or other settings, really would love to hear that as well. Yeah, so it looks like we have a mix of responses, which I'm really excited to have, um, especially for a lot of you saying that you haven't heard of expedited partner therapy. Thank you for being willing to be here and learn more. Excited to share more with you and um, a few of you sharing that you already do know about expedited partner therapy and some excitement to learn more. So. Really glad to have all of you here. We're going to dive um, into explaining what the process of expedited partner therapy is, what it looks like, um, and also how it can be utilized as a resource, particularly for teens and youth, to help expand access to treatment for STIs. Thanks so much for participating. So um, heading forward, I want to just give you all a little bit of background about essential access health. Some of you may be uh, familiar with our work already, um, but for those of you who are not, our mission is to champion and promote quality sexual health and reproductive health care for all. 
We achieve this mission through an umbrella of programs and services that include clinic support initiatives, provider trainings, advanced clinical research, advocacy, and consumer awareness. We also have longstanding partnerships with the California STD Control Branch and the Los Angeles Department of Public Health Division of HIV and STD programs. We implement best practices in STI prevention and in case management statewide. We offer a lot of different uh, programs that provide technical assistance, uh, quality improvement services, and medication access for STI prevention and treatment throughout the state. We'll go to the next slide. So a little bit of our agenda for today, we're gonna go over the basics of chlamydia and gonorrhea, cover what needs to be known to effectively implement expedited partner therapy for chlamydia and gonorrhea prevention and treatment. Um, of course, first covering the basics, then going into partner management for chlamydia and gonorrhea infections. We're gonna discuss expedited partner therapy as a partner management option and want to share with you all Essential Access Health's Chlamydia and Gonorrhea Expedited Partner Therapy Distribution Program that offers free chlamydia and gonorrhea medication to eligible clinic sites and local health jurisdictions in California. Also going to discuss some exciting news from Medi-Cal and Family Pact around offering EPT as a covered benefit. And talking about resources to integrate EPT into clinic sites. And I guess, again, as I mentioned in starting off this presentation, we're in a transitional time with our program name. And so I may use the terms EPT, which stands for Expedited Partner Therapy, and PDPT, which stands for Patient Delivered Partner Therapy, interchangeably. They both describe a similar practice. Our objectives for today are to explain the importance of EPT as a partner management and STI prevention strategy, to identify resources to support EPT implementation in a clinic setting, and to understand EPT insurance coverage and payment options. So at the end of this session, um, you all should be able to hopefully meet these objectives. And as well at the end, we'll be including a survey link um, for those of you who have sought out CEUs um, or continuing education credits for this session that you can complete in order to pursue those credits. So gonna start off with a brief review of the basics of chlamydia and gonorrhea infections. Chlamydia and gonorrhea are the most common reportable sexually transmitted infections in the United States. In 2019, approximately 1.8 million cases of chlamydia and 616,392 cases of gonorrhea were reported in the United States. These infections are concentrated primarily in young people, particularly females under the age of 25. And in most cases, females show no symptoms at all. Additionally, individuals with an STI are two to five times more likely than uninfected individuals to acquire an HIV infection following exposure to HIV through sexual contact. Individuals infected with both HIV and another STI are also mo more likely to transmit HIV through sexual contact with an HIV infected individual without another STI. So just additional STIs always adding on another burden to the immune system. So important to know how um, the systemic effects can happen. In this graph, it may be a little challenging to see. You can definitely see the increase in chlamydia cases over time since the 90s, um, but there's also been increases in gonorrhea as well as primary and secondary syphilis. The most common pathogens identified in people with a uterus with pelvic inflammatory disease or PID are gonorrhea and chlamydia. So PID is linked to gonorrhea and chlamydia infections. Untreated chlamydia and gonorrhea infections can cause PID when the infections move from the vagina up into the cervix to the upper structures of the female genital tract. 
which causes inflammation and potentially serious scarring of the fallopian tubes, which greatly increases the risk for dangerous ectopic pregnancies, infertility, and chronic pelvic pain. An ectopic pregnancy often most often occurs in a fallopian tube, which carries eggs from the ovaries to the uterus. This type of ectopic pregnancy is called a tubal pregnancy. Sometimes an ectopic pregnancy occurs in other areas of the body, such as the ovary, abdominal cavity, or lower part of the uterus, the cervix, which connects to the vagina. PID can occur even after a single symptomatic episode for some. One recent study found that those admitted with PID or tubo ovarian abscess found that in follow-up, 25.5% of them met the criteria for infertility. 16% had recurrent pelvic inflammatory disease and 13.8% reported chronic pelvic pain. Studies have also shown that multiple episodes of PID increase the risk for ectopic pregnancy by six to tenfold. The risk of tubal infertility is also increased and occurs in 8% of women after one episode of PID, 20% after two episodes, and 50% after three episodes. So in acute PID, it can include sudden severe symptoms, severe pain, abdominal discharge or bleeding, fever, nausea or dizziness. There's also silent PID where someone may experience no symptoms or be asymptomatic and chronic PID where milder symptoms may be mistaken for other conditions. The estimates of the likelihood of complications can vary, but all studies agree that these are common problems. Chlamydia, as well as gonorrhea and other infections can cause PID, which can lead to tubal scarring and ectopic pregnancy, chronic pelvic pain and infertility. So with this graphic um, that you see here, it's just demonstrating the complications associated with chlamydia specifically. Because we know that untreated STIs can cause complications, we wanna look closer at how we can manage and screen these infections, particularly for young people, just setting them up for success um, in the future. So just wanna go over the CDC screening recommendations. I do wanna note that the language listed in the recommendations is gendered. Um, and I will go over a little bit more of um, screening for transgender and gender diverse people as there are some limitations to how the screening recommendations are written. So according to the CDC screening recommendations, sexually active young women under the age of 25 should be screened annually for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Rectal chlamydia and pharyngeal and rectal gonorrhea screening can be considered in females based on reported sexual behaviors and exposure through shared clinical decision between the patient and provider. I think it's really important to consider um, three site testing, not only um, doing vaginal testing, but also rectal testing and pharyngeal testing in patients when it may be appropriate. Um, often people may think that three site testing is only applicable for men who have sex with men, but it's something that should be considered for all patients based on the, um, it's really more about what types of sex people are having rather than the genders or uh, of people or their partners. For sexually active women 25 years and older and men who have sex with women, they should be screened based on their risk factors, which can include known or suspect, uh, suspected exposure, new a new partner or more than one partner, a partner who may have additional partners or be non-monogamous, inconsistent condom use. Um, if a person or their partner uh, uses intravenous drugs, history of any prior STI diagnosis, or if there's a high prevalence in clinical settings, which definitely includes adolescent clinics and school-based health centers. All pregnant women should be screened for syphilis and HIV at their first prenatal visit with a retest during the third trimester, as well as at delivery for syphilis, if at a high risk. This could include living in a community with high syphilis morbidity, high HIV prevalence, or being at risk for syphilis acquisition during pregnancy. 
expanded syphilis screening recommendations have been released by the California Department of Public Health in 2020, which differ slightly from the CDC recommendations for syphilis and can be found on the California Department of Public Health website. Um, for pregnant people, California Department of Public Health recommends that patients should be screened for syphilis at least twice during pregnancy, once during confirmation of pregnancy or at first prenatal encounter, and again during the third trimester, regardless of whether such testing was performed or offered during the first two trimesters, as well as being screened at delivery, except for those who are at low risk or have documented negative screen. Additionally, rapid HIV tests should be performed at delivery if not previously screened during pregnancy. Um, for men who have sex with men, they should be screened annually for syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea at any sites of contact. So that could be the urethra, the rectum, or the pharynx, regardless of condom use and HIV. Also consider the benefits of offering more frequent screening for these infections between three and six months if a patient may be at an increased risk. For people who are transgender and gender diverse people, screening should be adapted based on anatomy. So some of the recommendations that are utilized for cisgender women under 24 years old should be extended to all patients who have a cervix. If over 25 years old, a person with a cervix should be screened if at increased risk. Consider screening at rectal and pharyngeal sites, again, based on reported sexual behaviors and exposure. Frequency of repeated screening should be based on the level of risk. Another consideration is connecting STIs with PrEP prevention, uh, utilizing PrEP as a way to prevent HIV. Patients with positive lab results for chlamydia and gonorrhea are at an increased risk of co-current syphilis and HIV infections. So it's recommended that they are also screened for these infections. For patients with positive STI results and negative HIV results, it's important to inform them about PrEP. PrEP is an effective method of preventing HIV infection, which is a once daily pill that people of any gender can use that's effective at stopping HIV infection when taken correctly. Um, you can get more information about PrEP at pleaseprepme.org. Also, any licensed provider can prescribe PrEP. Specialization in infectious diseases or HIV care is not required, which some people may not know. Um, and it's often recommended that primary care providers routinely offer PrEP to patients that it may be appropriate for that are eligible. Another consideration is utilizing PEP, which some of you may heard of, which is post-exposure prophylaxis for preventing HIV infection, which involves going to a medical facility or emergency room within 48 to 72 hours. Again, pleaseprepme.org has more information on how to obtain trainings or technical assistance regarding So when a patient tests positive for chlamydia or gonorrhea, it's important to review the following counseling messages with them, and that should be documented in their chart as well. All patients that test positive for chlamydia or gonorrhea, regardless of their age or their gender, should get retested three months after receiving treatment. Because those at risk for chlamydia are often also at risk for gonorrhea and vice versa, Retesting should be for both chlamydia and gonorrhea, regardless of what their initial results are. It's also strongly recommended that any patient treated for chlamydia or gonorrhea be tested again to identify reinfections as soon as possible. Ideally, getting tested at three months after initial treatment, though it's recommended that opportunistic testing occur whenever they return to the clinic within one to 12 months after treatment, since that may be the only time that a patient may return to a clinic. Another consideration as well, if a student may be coming in to a student health center, um, not for services related to STIs, but it may be a good time to retest them then. Um, in the next few slides, I'm gonna go over some of the importance of rescreening patients. 
So part of why retesting is so important is because repeat infection is common. In this um, chart, you can see that a study of family packed and Quest Diagnostics data shows that reinfection rates among women are two to three times the baseline positivity rates and reinfection rates are high across all age groups. You can see, um, particularly if you look in the 15 to 19 range, the rate of reinfection is especially high. Not only are reinfections common, but they're also dangerous. In fact, complications like pelvic inflammatory disease, which I went into a little bit more early in the presentation, and ectopic pregnancy are more likely with each repeat infection. So why reinfection occurs? Chlamydia and gonorrhea treatment failure is pretty rare. Most common reasons for repeat infection are because the patient had sex with a former sex partner that had an untreated STI or because the patient had sex with a new partner with an STI. To minimize the risk for reinfection, patients should also be instructed to abstain from sexual intercourse until all their sex partners are adequately treated and any symptoms are resolved. Some other considerations are to note that not all relationships are healthy and that could impact reinfection. There can be real and power imbalances that exist between partners that could impact whether or not someone can use protection from STIs. Um, intimate partner violence could also be uh, an element that could play into both prevention methods, treatment and communication about status. So it's important to assess the health of relationships in your visits and have consistent clinic protocols and culturally responsive referrals if you discover that a patient may be in an abusive relationship or experiencing intimate partner violence. Because we know reinfection um, shortly after treatment for chlamydia and gonorrhea is extremely common, we want to talk more about partner management. So going to go more into partner management and treatment options. Something um, I wanted to ask you all if you want to contribute in the chat is how does your clinic currently treat partners of STD positive patients, STI positive patients? If you have a um, patient who comes in and is positive, what's partner management looking like for their partners? So I'd love to hear um, some of your responses in the chat. I'm seeing partner delivered therapy. Great, excited to see somebody's implementing, yeah, partner, patient-delivered partner therapy, partner-delivered therapy, expedited partner therapy. That's one great way um, to treat patients. I'm seeing treat the patient in the clinic with stock meds, then send Rx to the pharmacy, patient picks up and gives to their partner. Got it. Yeah. So um, also that's a form of expedited partner therapy through prescription. Great. Great. Well, trying to bring... Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, trying to bring a partner into one of our clinics or using patient over partner therapy. Great. Yeah. So trying to have people um, get their treatment in person if possible is great and then patient delivery partner therapy if that's not an option wonderful thanks for sharing y'all i just yeah want to get a bit of a sense of what partner management is looking like um, so appreciate you all sharing that so um i'll go into kind of some of the models of what partner treatment can look like so as i've said reinfections are often caused by a current partner who didn't get treated. So as a result, it's really important to treat all recent sex partners from the past two months. Um, and it's important to provide patients with options so that they can choose what method they think will work best for each of their partners. 
Um, there may be some methods that look better, work better for certain partners and other methods that are going to work differently for different partners. The recommended and most effective option um, when it comes to treatment success is for a patient to bring their partner in with them to the clinic for simultaneous evaluation or treatment. We call this a BYOP, bring your own partner. Um, and one of the reasons that this partner treatment method is optimal is because both the patient and the partner are treated at the same time, which reduces the likelihood that the infection can be passed back and forth. Some other options include the patient telling their partner either directly or anonymously through online notification that their partner may be infected and that they should go get tested. Or uh, in some cases, the provider or another uh, clinic staff member can contact the patient's partner directly about um, their possible infection and need for treatment. Then another partner management option that's been shown to be effective at getting partners treated and reducing reinfection is expedited partner therapy or EPT, which we'll go into more in the next few slides. In the 2021 STI treatment guidelines from the CDC, they define expedited partner therapy as a harm reduction strategy and the clinical practice of treating sex partners of persons with diagnosed chlamydia or gonorrhea who are unable or unlikely to seek timely treatment by providing medications or prescriptions to the patient as allowable by law. Patients then provide partners with these therapies without the healthcare provider having examined the partner. The CDC recommends that medical providers routinely offer EPT to patients by stating that expedited partner therapy should be available to clinicians as an option for partner management. The CDC also acknowledges that healthcare programs differ, therefore when and how EPTs implemented will vary from site to site. It's important to regard EPT as one of the possible options for partner management and knowing that it won't be appropriate for all patients or all partners. So a little bit about EPT in California law. One of the most common questions we get is, is EPT legal in California? EPT is legal in California law and California law has explicitly allowed for EPT for chlamydia since 2001. And the law was expanded to allow for EPT for gonorrhea and other STIs in 2007. The current law allows for physicians to prescribe and nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, and certified nurse midwives to dispense, furnish, or otherwise provide antibiotic therapy uh, uh, to sex partners of individuals infected with chlamydia or gonorrhea, even if they've not been able to perform an exam of the patient's partner. Um, the legislation, the initial legislation uh, section 120582 of the Health and Safety Code provides an exception to the Medical Practice Act, which states that prescribing, dispensing, or furnishing drugs without a good faith prior examination and medical indication constitutes unprofessional conduct. This law allows for licensees to fully lawfully provide EPT and specifies that doing so because of the exception to the Medical Practice Act does not constitute unprofessional conduct. Excitingly, um, we also had on October 4th, uh, Governor Newsom signed SB 306, which is known as the STD Coverage and Care Act, which um, had some additional protections added and additional flexibility added to EPT providing in California law. So this bill requires healthcare providers to include expedited partner therapy or EPT on a prescription if they do not uh, have the name of a patient's sexual partner and would authorize a pharmacist to dispense an EPT prescription and label the drug without an individual's name if the prescription includes EPT or expedited partner therapy. So if you have uh, patients who do not know the names of or do not feel comfortable sharing, the name of their partner, they can still get a script for EPT by utilizing having EPT or expedited partner therapy written on the prescription. And this bill also specifies that a healthcare provider is not liable 
in any mal medical malpractice action or professional disciplinary action, and that pharmacists are not liable in civil, criminal, or administrative action if the healthcare provider's use of expedited partner therapy is in compliance with the law. This uh, new bill really helps to relieve some of the concerns from healthcare providers and pharmacists on expanding the use of EPT for patients who need it. So we're really excited that this bill has passed um, and is gonna help really extend protections uh, and relieve some of the concerns around providing EPT. So now that we've kind of gone over the law and different partner management strategy, I wanna go into a little bit more about what EPT is and some different counseling considerations. So EPT is an alternative uh, partner management strategy intended for sex partners of patients who test positive for an STI and is really intended to be used if the partner is truly unlikely or unable to seek care in a clinical setting. It's a safety net mechanism for getting partners treated and is not a substitution for patients coming into the clinic to get their partners treated. However, it is a great, highly effective, safe alternative for partners that are not likely or unable to get treated in a clinic. On the next slide, I'll go through more deeply how the steps of EPT happen. So EPT involves providing an index patient with the appropriate medication or prescription along with educational materials for the index patients, sex partner or partners. So first thing that has to happen is that the index patient themselves have to receive treatment. Then after they've received treatment and educational materials, they'll go through counseling with a provider and if a provider determines alongside their patient that EPT is the best fit for a partner or partners, the provider can then provide medication either directly or through a prescription to the index patient. Then the index patient will deliver the medication or prescription to their sex partner or partners, along with educational materials, particularly because the partner is not gonna be seen in the clinic. It's very important to include educational materials with each dose given. And then after the sex partners receive the medication, they take their medication and complete their treatment for chlamydia or gonorrhea and all partners have received treatment, thus preventing reinfection. There have been a number of randomized control trials that have demonstrated the effectiveness of EPT for reducing chlamydia and gonorrhea reinfection in the patient. This slide, I know it has um, several bar charts here, but summarizes five randomized control trials that um, show the percentage of patients who were reinfected at a follow-up visit. The blue bars show the reinfection rate among those who were assigned patient referral. So a patient being responsible for referring the partner to a clinic for treatment. The red bar then shows reinfection rates for those who were assigned to receive expedited partner therapy. All four studies that looked at reinfection for chlamydia only or for both gonorrhea and chlamydia demonstrate reduced reinfection rates for those who are receiving EPT. Then the last study also had a third category, which worked pretty well for reducing reinfection, which is to do patient referral and also provide booklets with tear out cards with information about the infection and treatment guidelines to give their partner. Interestingly, EPT has not shown the same effectiveness in reducing reinfection for trichomoniasis. However, it is still permissible um, under the law and is also a covered benefit through Family Pact and Medi-Cal um, to offer chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trichomoniasis treatment through expedited partner therapy. Um, but it has been shown a little less effective in um, these randomized control trials. So now that we know that EPT is effective in reducing reinfection, I'm going to go forward into a little more about the process. So I know I just mentioned this earlier, but again, want to highlight SB 306, that it really helps to expand provider and pharmacist liability protections, as well as 
offering the option to provide EPT prescriptions without a name. So really hoping to increase access by making providers and pharmacists feel safer in their liability, as well as um, having prescriptions more available, even if a name is not available. So I also wanted to share that uh, Medi-Cal and Family Pact are now offering, as of February 1st, 2020, expedited partner therapy as a covered benefit for Family Pact and Medi-Cal recipients. This includes chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trichomoniasis treatment. Um, it can be provided in visit if sites either package their own medication or order prepackaged medication through a vendor. Uh, prescriptions uh, can be used as well and should be written in the name of the index patient. So this uh, expedited partner therapy being offered through Medi-Cal and Family Pack is covered under the Medi-Cal or Family Pack coverage of that index patient because it's being seen as a preventative measure to prevent that index patient from experiencing reinfection. And through this coverage of Medi-Cal and Family Pack reimbursement, an index patient can be provided treatment for up to five partners. Um, with expedited partner therapy in general, legally, there's no limit to the amount of partners who can receive treatment, but in terms of coverage under Medi-Cal and Family Pact, they do uh, have a limit of five partners. Hey, Kayla, I yeah. think this is a great timely opportunity to answer a question we received earlier. Um, the question is, any chance do you know if we can get PrEP or PEP paid for by Family Pact, or are there any free low-cost options? Great question. Um, I'm not deeply aware of PrEP coverage under Family Pact and Medi-Cal. However, I do believe that the Please Prep Me website has a lot of information around accessing free or low cost uh, prep. And I know that um, in a lot of different locations, there's prep navigators who help uh, young people in some teen clinics, help young people access prep for free or low cost. So um, I would definitely say to visit pleaseprepme.org to try to seek out some additional information. And also um, for whoever submitted the question, we can try to link up afterwards and I can try to get a fuller answer to that question for you as well. Anything else that came through the chat that we should address at the moment? Actually, I just saw a response from someone in the chat who says that PrEP is not covered by a family pack, but it is covered by Medi-Cal. Great. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for um, the knowledge sharing. I appreciate that. Yep. That's what we've got for now. Thanks, Okay, Kayla. great. Yeah, for sure. Um, so now I'm going to go into um, the treatment recommendations for chlamydia and gonorrhea and how they differ between first line treatment or the treatment that someone would get in a clinic versus what's provided through expedited partner therapy. So the first line treatment for um, chlamydia is now with the new STI treatment recommendations is doxycycline. 100 milligrams orally twice a day for seven days. Um, and this is unless someone may be pregnant uh, because doxycycline is contraindicated for uh, pregnancy. For EPT, someone may receive doxycycline 100 milligrams orally twice a day for seven days or azithromycin one gram orally once. For gonorrhea in visit, someone would receive an uh, injection, intramuscular injection of ceftriaxone 500 milligrams once. And then for expedited partner therapy, the treatment is 800 milligrams of cefixime orally once. So available evidence supports that doxycycline is more effective in tre treating chlamydia infections in the urogenital, rectal, and pharyngeal sites. But azithromycin remains high efficacy for urogenital infection among women. There is a concern regarding the effectiveness of azithromycin for concurrent rectal chlamydia infection, which can occur commonly 
um, and cannot be solely predicted by reported sexual activity. There was a recent uh, family pack webinar on implementing the CDC STI treatment guidelines. Um, uh, it was titled 2021, a conversation for family pack providers and was on September 8th of 2021, where Dr. Ina Park shared that in observational studies and randomized controlled trials, the efficacy of doxycycline and azithromycin for your general uh, infection was a 3% difference. For rectal chlamydia, there can be an 8 to 20% difference in treatment failure when using azithromycin instead of doxycycline. So these are all important considerations um, to consider when selecting which medication to provide. When non-adherence to doxycycline is a substantial concern, azithromycin of one gram once is an alternative treatment option, but it may require post-treatment evaluation and testing because of the lower treatment efficacy among persons with rectal infection. For patients who are pregnant, uh, clinical experience and published studies indicate that azithromycin is safe and effective during pregnancy. And like I mentioned, that um, doxycycline is contraindicated for pregnancy. So if a patient is or may become pregnant, it's important to consider um, which medication to utilize and to avoid doxycycline. Um, definitely when someone's pregnant and if they may become pregnant, taking that into consideration. The CDC recommended treatment for gonorrhea infections is 500 milligrams of sex ceftriaxone intermuscularly as a single dose. Um, this is important to consider for individuals who weigh more than or equal to 300 pounds. A single one gram intermuscular dose of ceftriaxone should be administered. And if chlamydia infection has not been excluded, um, doxycycline 100 milligrams orally twice a day for seven days is recommended. So a shift has happened also in the STI treatment guidelines that um, dual treatment when someone uh, has gonorrhea was previously the recommended that dual treatment should always be done, both the treatment for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Now it is solely if chlamydia infection has not been excluded to also include treatment for chlamydia. Um, with EPT uh, for gonorrhea, or if ceftriaxone is not available, an 800 milligram dose of cefixime is an alternative regimen. Um, and also, similarly, if chlamydia infection has not been excluded, they can be treated with a single oral 800 milligram dose of cefixime plus uh, oral doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. Test of cure is recommended for patients with pharyngeal gonorrhea seven to 14 days after initial treatment, regardless of the treatment regimen, but particularly with cefixime, there may be um, some reduced efficacy in the pharyngeal site. So just a little bit of kind of background on how the treatments can differ. Oh, sorry, my slides. <laughs> um, how the treatments can differ for expedited partner therapy versus first line treatment. So um, one thing I also wanted to discuss a little bit in the chat was if um, folks have any opinions about providing doxycycline as the preferred treatment for chlamydia. I would love to hear if there are any questions or concerns, if any of you already um, currently provide doxycycline for patients who test positive um, or not. Yeah, would love to hear because I know that this change um, had significant impact for some. So would love to hear some of your thoughts. I'm seeing, I only do doxy for prostatitis. Okay. 
Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Colleen. I saw in the chat you added, um, unaware of the change until recently, start offering docs if you're worried about team compliance. That's something I hear a lot, particularly when it comes to teens and adolescents, um, is, yeah, is considering with teens, um, especially when offering for expedited partner therapy, which is that additional layer of someone who you do not have in the visit to provide that counseling to or to assess um, their potential adherence, that that is a concern. Yeah, so that's just um, food for thought, I think, of really up to clinical judgment of what makes the most sense um, for different patients and partners. Um, that doxy is now recommended as the first line treatment, but um, also that in some cases you may evaluate that it's not uh, the best suited for your patients or their partners. Thanks for sharing, y'all. Um, so I wanted to go a little bit into evaluating some counseling questions to evaluate if EPT is an appropriate choice for your patient and their partner or partners. So some questions that you wanna ask are, what is the likelihood that their partner will come into a clinic and get tested and treated? You can think about, particularly if you're in a school-based health center, um, is this partner already part of your school system, already someone who's been linked into the school health center? Are they, do they even go to the school um, that your patient attends? Those are all some considerations about how easy it will be um, for that partner to come into a clinic and get tested and treated and yeah, really inquiring with your patient. Another component to ask is if a patient would feel comfortable um, notifying directly their partner and providing them medication, um, wanting to see, do they feel comfortable and safe around talking to their partner about this? Do they feel like that's something they could do? And then to their knowledge, if their partner has any medication allergies, any serious health problems, or any symptoms of a more serious infection. Um, some serious health problems could include kidney, liver, or cardiac disease, or um, other uh, more serious infection symptoms like fever, pelvic pain in patients with uterus, or testicular pain in patients with testes. If all of the answers to these questions are um, no, then EPT could uh, be a consideration. If there's no concerns around uh, partners health uh, associated with this treatment, if they feel comfortable directly notifying their partner and they know that their partner will not likely come into a clinic, it could be a fit. Some other supportive questions to ask could include, how do you think your partner would react? What are you most worried about? When and where is a good place to have this conversation with your partner? And offering to your patient with practicing this conversation um, help you. Some important uh, reminders to give to your patients around difficult conversations could be giving themselves plenty of time to talk, breathe, to center themselves, and remind them why they're having this conversation because they respect their partner and honor transparency and would want the same. So also kind of providing some of that support, especially with teens, um, giving them the support to have these conversations. Um, and along with that, always addressing the safety of the patient around sharing their positive status. It's important that patients are feeling safe and comfortable to initiate partner notification of treatment if it could compromise their safety, if they're experiencing intimate partner violence or an abusive relationship they may be more afraid to notify their partner or it may not be safe for them to notify their partner. So really reassess if EPT is a safe option for them to utilize as well. Screening for EPT also provides uh, additional opportunities to link youth, link patients to other services including screening for intimate partner violence. You can provide space for clients to think about what's on their safer sex checklist. So thinking about, are they talking with their partners about their sexual history? 
Um, are they and their partner getting tested for STIs before sex or getting regularly tested? Uh, are they sharing their results? Do, what are their boundaries? Is that part of the discussion? This could be a point to kind of brainstorm with a patient around what are some of the things that they value around safer sex um, and that they want in their relationships? Also reviewing for them that consent is not just about if you want to have sex, but also how you want to have sex. Um, and educating and emphasize the importance of testing regularly for STIs, especially as most STIs do not present symptoms. So who can receive EPT? All partners um, who within the last two months of index patient's diagnosis, um, if they have not had sex partners within the last two months than the most recent sex partners. Partners can be of any sex or gender. Sexual orientation of the patient does not impact EPT consideration, and there's no limit of the number of doses that can be distributed in the case of multiple sex partners. The one exception with Medi-Cal and Family Pact, having um, five doses covered under an index patient's Medi-Cal or Family Pact coverage. When EPT is not recommended is if someone is co-infected with STIs that are not treatable by ECPT medication, particularly if someone has HIV or syphilis, should not be used in any cases where there's suspected child abuse, sexual assault, or again, anytime that a patient's safety is in question. If partners have severe allergies to antibiotics, um, if there's pharyngeal gonorrhea, again, the regimen used for EPT for gonorrhea is not as uh, effective at treating the infection in the throat. So considering that um, it may not cure all throat in gonorrhea and that, um, that and it may not cure all the gonorrhea that someone experiences in their throat infection. So considering getting them into the clinic as best as possible. And also again, if partners are symptomatic, they have a more serious condition. Some particular considerations for men who have sex with men that are covered in California EPT guidelines um, state that regardless of patient's gender or sexual orientation, EPT can be utilized, but again, that pharyngeal gonorrhea infection may be a risk and that um, with a patient not coming into the visit, that there could be missed opportunities to offer HIV screening to identify co-current STI and HIV infection. So component considerations. Like I mentioned before, it's really important to package educational materials with expedited partner therapy that provide information about the infection, instructions for the medication, medication warnings, and getting tested for HIV and other STIs, providing clinic referral, and additional resources could include PEP and PrEP, emergency contraceptive and condoms. Some potential risks. Um, the medications are generally well tolerated and uh, cephalosporin allergy is pretty, risk is pretty low. Um, so that's important to consider um, that generally pretty well tolerated, but still important to educate people about potential adverse reactions. Very important to emphasize that doxycycline is not safe in pregnancy and so should not be utilized for uh, anyone who's pregnant or could be, may become pregnant. Um, allergic reactions for azithromycin reactions are rare. And for cefixime, um, reactions are uncommon. But if someone has a history of immunoglobulin-mediated penicillin allergy, uh, with anaphylaxis, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, or a toxic epidermal necrolysis that it may not be appropriate for them to take cefixime. And then just, again, potential risk could be missed opportunity to receive other services. Key counseling messages, again, is that partners should read the education material before taking the medication, seek a complete STI evaluation as soon as possible, not take the medication and seek care if they're allergic to antibiotics, have serious health problems or symptoms of more serious infection. Partners who are pregnant should seek care as soon as possible. Patients and partners should abstain from sex or use a condom at least seven days after treatment in order to decrease the risk of reinfection. 
and should get tested three months after treatment. So along with that too, um, I'll show you all at the end, but we have on Essential Access Health's PDPT website, we have educational materials that are already created in a variety of languages that can be used for this purpose. So now I wanna move on to expedited partner therapy in a school-based health setting in particular. So I have a um, case study to bring up for you. So Max is a 16 year old male who is at the school based health center for a sports physical. He decides to get tested for chlamydia and gonorrhea during his visit. His chlamydia test comes back positive and he says he uses condoms sometimes. He shares that he's had two partners in the last two months. One partner goes to school here and one partner graduated from high school a few towns over. Some important questions to consider are, why is it important for providers to be prepared to discuss sexual health in a primary care setting? What more information do we need about Max's partners to assess if EPT might be a good fit? And how might partner management strategies differ for Max's partner who attends school here versus a partner who lives two towns over. So I'd be curious to see if you all have any um, just initial thoughts on uh, how what what more info might we need about Max's partners or Max to assess if EPT would be a good fit for him. So you can add to the chat if you have any thoughts. Great. Yeah. What kind of sex is Max having? Um, oral sex, anal sex, vaginal sex, um, and who's performing what on two? That's all good assessments to consider uh, where um, the infections may lie for Max's partners. And also considering in screening Max, where does Max need to be tested? At what sites? So I want to also put in a little poll of uh, asking, can Max receive PDPT as a minor? Would love to see what you all think. Okay, great. Yes, I'm seeing some responses come in. Yeah, so Max can receive uh, EPT as a minor because it's considered part of STI treatment, which is covered under minor consent law in California. So that's a question I've got before of, you know, how can we give teens uh, this medication or how can we give teens EPT that it is something that's covered under minor consent as part of STI treatment. So I know some of y'all shared a few things um, in the chat about considerations and just some things to consider in this case with Max is when discussing partner management with a patient at school-based health center, remember that some partners may not attend this, the same school, some may not, some partners may be engaged and embedded and often attending school, some may not be present um, at school. And that, that doesn't mean that a patient cannot receive EPT um, just because they, that a patient's partner cannot receive EPT just because they don't go to the same school. Um, offering on-site treatment for patients is important in adolescents uh, as well because they are less likely to fill prescriptions for STI treatment 
And beyond the gender of the patients, considering the types of sex the patient is having when dispensing EPT and remembering again that suffixing can be less effective when treating pharyngeal gonorrhea. Noting if any partners are or may become pregnant as doxycycline is unsafe during pregnancy. Thinking about if a patient's partner is at the school, can you leverage um, your school-based model to bring in their partners for first-line treatment and have them actually come into the visit? And also that providing a PPT may be a good option for partners who do not attend the same school. Now that I've gone into a bit of an example about how this could look at a school-based health center, I wanna share a little bit more about Essential Access Health's Chlamydia and Gonorrhea EPT Distribution Program, which supplies chlamydia and gonorrhea medication to eligible clinic sites and local health jurisdictions free of charge. So our uh, EPT distribution program requires that clinic sites be located in California, serve a population at risk for STIs, um, who is uninsured or underinsured or otherwise cannot access uh, expedited partner therapy. And one big piece is that they provide index patient treatment for chlamydia and gonorrhea already. Um, just the medication needs to be provided through direct on-site dispensing to the index patient. Um, and the could also be provided through an on-site pharmacy or in local health jurisdictions can be provided through field delivered treatment. To participate in our program, um, sites are required to distribute EPT to chlamydia or gonorrhea patients for treatment of partners who are unable or unlikely to seek care. They are required to include educational materials, maintain a log of dispensed medication, and to watch um, our webinar to keep up to date on the program. So this is one way, particularly if people do not have, are not seeing primarily Medi-Cal or family pack patients or enrolling people in Medi-Cal or family pack would be barrier to accessing expedited partner therapy, that our program may be a way to provide medication for sites. Some clinical considerations for operationalizing EPT can include having uh, clinical protocols for STI treatment, um, for in some cases, a pharmacy for on-site treatment, offering same-day visits for EPT, which is also, I think, offering same-day visits for youth um, as a population that can be hard to schedule or hard to reach is just a great practice in general. Having clinical and staff training um, also promoting expedited partner therapy. I'll show you all some great images that we've created that are youth focused. Um, they can reach out as well if you'd like to have access to those. And considering prepackaging medication with directions written on the package or label and including counseling messages either on the bag or the package. So some take home points from today are that reinfection is common and dangerous for the patient. It's preferable for partners to come into the clinic to get treated, but when it's unlikely, expedited partner therapy is an allowable, recommended, and evidence-based alternative to ensure that partners receive treatment. Healthcare providers and pharmacists are protected from liability when offering EPT by California law, and Essential Access Health's Chlamydia and Gonorrhea EPT Distribution Program provides a supply of free prepackaged medication to eligible sites. And if you'd like to learn more about our program, you can visit essentialaccess.org slash PDPT. And now I just wanna share some resources with you all as well. Um, to support the potential of implementing EPT and other STI services at your sites. There is, um, this is a great website for helping notify uh, partners called tellyourpartner.org. This is a great way to do anonymous notification via text if someone is not comfortable notifying a partner directly. The CDC STI treatment guidelines, as I mentioned, there's been quite a few updates. Um, so great to check in uh, and it's just found on the CDC website. The California Department of Public Health has PDPT guidelines specifically um, with guidance for medical providers in California. 
So that's a great resource to reference as well. I uh, also wanted to mention again, um, the essentialaccess.org slash PDPT slash resources uh, website. We have screening and treatment guidelines, sample medication logs, free patient education materials in multiple language, including English, Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Tagalog. Um, and we're always working on expanding languages. Um, and we have patient awareness materials as well that can be posted in a clinic or included. You can also email me if you'd like um, any of these uh, sent to your clinic that you'd like to have in person. We also um, recently created a document specifically for pharmacists to help educate them on uh, the practice of expedited partner therapy. Um, and then a couple resources I wanted to share with our youth focus is some of you all may be familiar with our website, teensource.org. Um, can also be found on Instagram as at teensource.org as a great way to provide information for young people in California on sexual and reproductive health. And I did want to show you all as well if you're interested. These are some images we made specifically for uh, youth around expedited partner therapy or, or PDPT as well um, to kind of get young people thinking about how they can provide treatment for their partners. And another highlight um, is our teen source clinic finder where young people can find a clinic by them uh, using searching using their zip code. And we have a couple images um, for youth uh, targeted at youth as well for helping find a clinic near them. So if you're interested in accessing any of these images to utilize for your clinic to post on, um, if you have social media accounts for any of your uh, school-based health centers or would wanna have print versions, please feel free to reach out and let me know. And I will go ahead and uh, move on to questions. Um, here's my uh, contact information if you wanna follow up. My email is k-h-e-e-k-i-n at essentialaccess.org and we'd be happy to hear more from you but want to just hold um some few a few minutes for any questions that may have come up great and Haley also added the uh, link to the survey for those of you who were looking for um continuing education credits that that is available for you and that's how you can pursue those credits is to complete that survey. Appreciate the thank yous, yeah. And if any other questions roll in, happy to answer those as well. Yeah, and if anyone is interested in implementing, providing uh, expedited partner therapy in your school-based health centers, or if you already are and you can use technical assistance, um, any guidance or questions or thinking through uh, any of that implementation, please feel free to reach out. We're also, in addition to having our program where we offer um, that we, um, can also do technical assistance as well, even if you don't participate in our program. Olivia, I see your question. Do you have any recommendations for clinics that don't have an EMR given California's new 
law about prescriptions needing to be sent electronically. Um, could you share a little bit more, Olivia, maybe about um, the, the limitations of the law that you're um, sharing specifically? I don't know if I know the law that you're referencing specifically. Because we have had historically um, many providers write uh, scripts, um, just paper scripts for expedited partner therapy. Okay, got it. All right, thanks for sharing that, Olivia. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know that I have a great answer for you in terms of guidance around um, maintaining an EMR and that scripts need to be sent electronically. However, um, if you want to follow up offline, we do have a pharmacist consultant we worked with specifically around um, in the context of expedited partner therapy specifically, who may be able to provide um, some more guidance. So would happy uh, be happy to connect more afterwards if you want um, to see if we might come to seek an answer together. I'll just pop my um, email in the chat again. Yeah, and with the few remaining moments, happy to take any other questions um, that may roll in or come in. Appreciate all of you for being here and being present. Um, really, uh, I really care about expedited partner therapy and think it's an amazing harm reduction practice. And um, yeah, just hope more and more people can know about it and um, find ways to, I think particularly for teens and young people who already face so many barriers to accessing care, I think it's an exciting way to um, help bridge access where it's not already there. So, and thank you all so much for all the work you do to keep our young people healthy and give them access to options and choices around their health. see uh, one more question. I know we only have one minute left, but um, someone saying if there is anyone who's feeling scared about being um, protected lawfully when they would need to tell their partner about an infection, um, are there any protections that they have um, in the law? Uh, are you, is this a question specifically, sorry, let me if you read the question again, I'm trying to understand, is this asking if the index patient has protection? Yeah, so if they're oh. nervous about telling a partner. Yeah, I think um, there's no, uh, to my knowledge, there's no criminalizing laws in California around disclosing a uh, STI status when it comes to chlamydia and gonorrhea. I know that throughout the country there are some uh, laws that can criminalize or penalize people who um, disclose HIV status or fail to disclose uh, status, which is a 
larger problem um, and not ethical, but uh, in terms of there's no um, particular legal action that I think someone can take when it comes to disclosing uh, an STI status against someone in terms of um, physical harm or other issues. If there's already power dynamics um, or intimate partner violence, that's a little more um, under the realm of intimate partner violence laws and uh, laws just around personal physical safety. Great. Thank you so much, Kayla. Uh, this was a really, really informative session, and I definitely enjoyed being able to, to learn this stuff. Um, so for those of you who would like to fill out a survey for a chance to win any of our raffle prizes, I have linked it in the chat. And otherwise, we'll see you in our future sessions today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks again, everyone. Take care.